<laughs> My name is Jeanette Millard. I'm co-president of Green Hudson. And um, hello to the video audience. Uh, I'm glad you're here tonight for our presentation about electric vehicles, which is something that our town is wondering about in terms of parking, and it's something that people, I just got an EV, and I know we have at least two other, this, this side of the table is only for bolt owners. <laughs> uh, but um, I have to say that during the purchase, I called your organization and talked to Ezra and got fabulous information about all the ways to get money from the government, and I got it. So it, it was really, he was great. And very, I'll let him know. Please do, yes. And um, so we want some basic information, but also, you know, the, the run of, of uh, information and what's the newest and <coughs> greatest and what about the adapter for Tesla parking and all that stuff. So this is part of our series of climate cafes that we're doing for public uh, outreach and education as part of Green Hudson. Thank you very much Thank for you. coming. We appreciate it. And will you talk about your organization? To start Absolutely. Um, I work for an organization called Green Energy Consumers Alliance. We do not go by GECA. Uh, we go by Green Energy Consumers for short. Um, some of you might be familiar with us under the name of Mass Energy. We used to be called Mass Energy Consumers Alliance, but we got confused for the state Mass Save Rebate Program a lot, so we rebranded. Um, we do business in Massachusetts and Rhode Island across both states, and our mission is all about empowering consumers and also communities to speed the just transition to a zero carbon world. So we do that. We do work in a couple different sectors. We work on in transportation, but also uh, buildings and heating and electricity generation. And for all of these, we do work directly with consumers or communities, often a lot of education, but we also run group buying, group buying programs and things like that. Um, but we also do work uh, on state policy. Um, so in the transportation space, for example, our program is very focused on electric vehicles, but on the advocacy side, we're talking about electrifying fleets and public transit and walking and biking and all of that too. So we have our hands sort of in both pots, which I think is kind of unique and kind of cool because we can use what we learn from talking to real people or dealers or um, the electric utilities with their incentive programs and use that to inform the state advocacy work that we do. But we also know what's happening on the state advocacy world, which can inform the education work that we do. Um, so this is most of our team at our last um, meeting in Boston. Mm -hmm. This is me, <laughs> my name is Anna, I'm our electric vehicle program director, um, and I will just move right along. So the first section of this is sort of why electric cars, and then we've got a things you should know section that's all about charging um, and road trips and incentives, and then um, at the end we can talk about different car models. But the basic high level of this section is going to be that there are lots of benefits of EVs, both societally and also for you, the driver. So societally, um, they're better for the environment, both in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and in terms of the particulate matter and the NOx and SOx emissions and the ground level ozone and all the awful things that um, gas powered cars spew into the air. And this is also a place where I want to mention like all the harm done in the fossil fuel supply chain from wherever we're fracking and flaring methane and transporting and all of that. Obviously, there's other supply chain issues that we can talk about, but those are all the, the things that we're thinking about trying to minimize. Um, the vehicles are much more efficient, and that expresses itself in lower fuel costs um, for you. And then they're cheaper to charge and maintain. There's fewer moving parts to break. And for people who care about this, they're fun and fast and quiet. Um, I, I think I don't care about those things, and then I get in a zip card to get here, and it's gas powered. <laughs> it's so slow, it's so loud. Wow. Um, so you do notice the difference uh, once you've made the switch. So a lot of times when I say EVs are uh, have fewer greenhouse gas emissions, everybody goes, yeah, yeah, but what about how we're fueling them? Like, how are we generating the electricity? Mm -hmm. And this is where we point to data from the Union of Concerned Scientists. They have a really cool tool where you can plug in any zip code in the country and it'll show you, based on the makeup of the electric grid in that region, how do EVs stack up? So 
when we last checked this, the average gas-powered car emits 381 grams of carbon dioxide emissions per mile driven. If you look at a plug-in hybrid, which is a vehicle that has a battery that you can charge up by plugging it into a wall outlet, but then also has a backup gas tank, um, that cuts your emissions about in half uh, on a per mile basis. Obviously, there are some assumptions here about how much you're driving on electricity versus gas, but I trust you know, concerned scientists to, to do good math. And then if you switch to a full battery electric uh, vehicle, that brings your emissions down to 96 grams of carbon dioxide emissions per mile, which, again, these are not coming out of the tailpipe, but this is what you're responsible for based on the electricity you're drawing from the grid. And that number is going down all the time, both because the vehicles are getting more efficient and because our grid is getting cleaner. So when we started this program a couple of years ago, this was at 104 grams mm -hmm. of carbon dioxide emissions per mile. So it's been cool to see that go down in, in real time. How's the grid getting more efficient? We've got really great laws. Um, I, okay, we have laws. <laughs> so we've got um, a couple of different standards that in various ways require electricity suppliers to add more renewable energy. So the base one that we have is called um, the Renewable Energy Portfolio Standard, and it requires electric utilities or suppliers to source an increasing amount of renewable energy every year. And then there's other standards sort of layered on top of that. There's the Clean Energy Standard, and there's a Clean Peak Standard, and they interact in confusing ways. But the baseline is Massachusetts is really unique that in 2008, we passed a law called the Global Warming Solutions Act that mandated economy-wide emissions reductions. Other states have laws that are like, we would like to, maybe. But in Massachusetts, it's a, it's a mandate, which means if the state fails to promulgate the regulations to make that happen, you can sue the state. Wow. And so the organization I work for partnered with the Conservation Law Foundation a couple years ago and did that, which is why there's now those regulations layered on top of the Renewable Energy Portfolio Standard. Mm -hmm clean energy standards and those other things because we weren't on track to meet those emissions reductions and those standards help. When you say they did that, they sued the state? Yeah. Oh, it went to the Supreme cool. Judicial Court of Massachusetts, which was, mm -hmm. which was fun. This was before I was there. I, I showed up and they were like, we just did this thing. And I was like, that's cool. <laughs> did they win? <laughs> they did. No. So that, that forced right. Governor Baker at the time to promulgate these new regulations that he didn't really want. Mm -hmm. um, all of this is really important because transportation is the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in Massachusetts. So this is a this is a pie chart. Um, it says 2023. That's supposed to say 2020 because we are slow at updating um, uh, numbers like this in the state. But if you had looked at this 20 years ago, the electric power chunk would have been way 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 bigger. Um, we've retired a lot of coal and oil, unfortunately replaced a lot of it with natural gas, but uh, are still seeing there's so much more wind and solar than there has been. The two big sectors that we need to crack are transportation and buildings. Um, yeah. I can send you to my colleague to learn about buildings, but buildings are hard. But transportation is huge, and we've got relatively good federal efficiency standards that are supposed to keep making our vehicles more efficient. The problem is we're all driving more miles than we ever have and vehicles are getting bigger. So those efficiency gains haven't really resulted in lowered emissions. So if you look at transportation emissions in Massachusetts over time, it's pretty standard. There's a big dip for COVID and then it comes right back up again. Um, so the states, all the states, clean energy and climate plans are very clear. We need to reduce the number of miles that we drive um, through better public transit, walking, biking, and we need to electrify. When we talk about emissions, a lot of times people ask, but what about manufacturing? Mm -hmm. Like I've heard that battery manufacturing has a lot of emissions impacts. It does. But again, I will point to the Union of Concerned Scientists. Um, the bump, the higher level of uh, manufacturing emissions that you see with EVs is more than taken care of by the lifetime emissions reduction. So in this graph, we're comparing cars and trucks. Um, orange is the manufacturing of just the vehicle, and then blue is the battery manufacturing, so you see that just on the electric versions. And then you see the vehicle operation, which is the majority of the lifetime emissions, and you can see that even taking into account battery manufacturing, the lifetime emissions of an electric car are half that of a gas car, and 57% or 50% less than a gas truck. This is uh, based on national numbers in terms of how, how clean the grid is. 
In Massachusetts, those reductions would be bigger because our grid is cleaner than the national average. Um, so obviously there's lots of other concerns about supply chains of all types, um, but at least on the greenhouse gas emissions front, there's, there's a lot of compelling data that shows over the life of the vehicle, there's a big reduction. Along with greenhouse gas emissions, there are really, really clear public health benefits of electrifying transportation, particularly diesel vehicles, that, which is a whole other conversation we could have, but even um, just the vehicles that we drive. I, I did not know this before working on this program, but the gas that we all burn in our um, vehicles has a lot of public health harms that are just born somewhere else in the system. So. Um, the Union of, no sorry, the American Lung Association, there you go, is a, um, a big proponent of the EVs. They've, they've been pushing on the national level for better uh, vehicle standards and they release a report every year called Driving to Clean Air and I can share that link with you where they um, support policies that will help us switch over the fleet faster. And then I don't know what happened to the words, but <laughs> climate change itself is a public health threat, um, which we could spend a whole hour talking about too. One of the reasons why electric vehicles are so much cleaner is that they are so much more efficient. Um, when you put a gallon of gas into a gas car, only 20% of the energy in that gallon of gasoline actually ends up contributing to your vehicle moving. 80% of it is lost to friction and heat and all sorts of other waste, which is wild to me that we've been working on internal combustion <laughs> engines for that long and they're still that inefficient. Yeah. EVs are closer to 60, 70, 80 percent efficient and the easiest way to sort of conceptualize this is to look at miles per gallon of gas cars and then miles per gallon electric. And so the MPGE is how far does that electric vehicle go on the amount of energy that is stored in one gallon of gasoline, which is 33.7 kilowatt hours. Mm -hmm. So it allows you to look at this sort of apples to apples and so on the right in orange we've got um, some gas powered cars that people know of, um, from slightly smaller sedan-y types of things, the Toyota Corolla to Ford F-150. If you saw the Ford F-350 on here, we'd just all cry. Um, but then you've got battery electric vehicles on the left in all blue, and then in the middle you've got these plug-in hybrids that can do both mm -hmm. gas and electric. And you can see that these electric vehicles, the Hyundai Ioniq has been one of, has been the most efficient in, in battery basically on the market for a long time, it gets the equivalent of 140 miles per gallon, which we're just never going to get to with gas. Um, so it can help sort of understand um, the difference on efficiency. Hopefully you'll put the Chevy Volt back on there when they make it again. The Volt with the V or the Volt? Volt, Volt, Yes. Oh yeah, there's so many more cars that we could put on here. We just kind of yeah. pick a couple at random, I think, <laughs> um, but we have, on our, our website, which I'll show you at the end, for every vehicle we show you what the MPG is, so you can even look at that. So that efficiency um, also translates into lower fuel costs. And so Massachusetts has um, a bunch of different electric utilities. What's the electric utility in Hudson? It's a muni, so it's- You've got a muni, so you've got even lower electric prices. We have- 12 cents a kilowatt state. hour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm over here in Cambridge paying 29 cents a kilowatt yeah, hour. Yeah. You guys should all go electric. These savings are just so much stronger for yeah. you than anybody else. And the yeah. the munis across Massachusetts tend to have lower electricity prices. For sure. I think my understanding is a lot of the reason why munis are cheaper is that you've got more flexibility as to when you go into the market to bid. So mass save is maybe like a cent or two of the difference, but the rest is that the big investor owned utilities have to file every six months and sometimes that is just at a time where the market isn't as good um, but basically on our website we do the math every time the rates change so we're a little um, well it is March so <laughs> we don't have the rates the new ones yet for Rhode Island but we show okay if we've got if we're assuming this gas efficiency for a gas car and this efficiency for an electric vehicle and we use the bolt as an example this is how much it would cost to drive a mile on electricity versus a mile on gas, and this is what your savings look like. And we show our methodology if people want to do this. There are tools out there that let you do this, but a lot of them are based on national electricity mm -hmm. prices, and yes. we've got higher electricity prices than most of the country, except you guys who have great electricity prices. <laughs> um, so we, we show our math to sort of um, walk people through it. Um, the other piece in terms of 
uh, benefits for the individual is that the maintenance and repair costs are so much lower. Um, there just are fewer moving parts in a battery electric vehicle. Um, Consumer Reports did a study a couple of years ago where they looked at several thousand actual EV drivers' costs and did the math and found that over the life of the vehicle, um, you have about half the repair and maintenance costs in an EV compared to a gas car. Um, there's lots of different reasons why that is that I'm happy to go into, but one of the most compelling, if slightly messy, ways of looking at this is this lovely graph from the Department of Energy that shows you just the scheduled maintenance costs mm -hmm. for um, an ICE vehicle is an internal combustion engine mm -hmm. vehicle, so a gas car. An uh, HEV is a hybrid electric vehicle, so a traditional hybrid that doesn't plug in, then a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle and a battery electric vehicle. And you can see here, this just on the scheduled maintenance costs, the battery electric vehicle is about 60% of what the gas car is. And I don't know if you can see, but it, it shows you what all the colors um, refer to and so the transmission service spark clubs clubs plugs oxygen sensor timing belt none of that exists with the EV that whole category of costs just is irrelevant and then even some of the existing costs are are lower um, one example of that is uh, it's kind of hard to see on this graph but the brake pads the scheduled maintenance costs are lower, and part of the reason, I don't know if you on your boat have experienced the one pedal driving, yeah. but there's something called regenerative braking, where if you turn it on, basically the car recognizes if you take your foot off of the accelerator that you want to slow down, and so it'll slow you down by spinning magnets <laughs> around the motor and capturing that energy and putting it back into the battery, which means you don't have to use your friction brakes as frequently, which means they last longer. So there's little things like that that mean some of these categories are shorter, even if the same category still exists. On the last slide, on the previous slide, it says it's unlikely you'll ever have to replace the battery. This is a concern that everybody is like, yeah. am I gonna have to replace the battery? Um, so the first thing to know is the batteries are warranted for eight years or 100,000 miles across the board. Some manufacturers do more than that, but that's, that's sort of the minimum. Um, there are cases where the battery has the bolt, for example, classically, or classically, unfortunately, they discovered that there was a minor manufacturing defect in some of them. They replaced all the ones that needed to be replaced at no cost to the drivers, and when they replaced the battery, they, they put in a better battery, so a lot of those bolt drivers saw a, a bump in range. What people are concerned about is like nine years down the road, yeah. am I gonna need to replace the battery? And it looks like it won't need to happen um, for a couple of reasons. One is if there's a manufacturing defect, it's going to be found out in those first eight years. It's, it's not likely to wait until year nine to pop out. And then the main concern that people have is the reduction in range. So as you use batteries and they heat up and cool down and heat up and cool down, the, the capacity decreases the same way it does on your phone, just a little bit slower. Um, and there is more and more data now because there's more and more electric vehicles about how fast that um, degradation actually happens and it's about 1% a year and it's actually slowing down as the battery management software in the vehicles is getting smarter mm -hmm. so you won't really notice on these vehicles that at this point have over 250 maybe 300 400 miles per eight miles per charge when that's degraded 10% that's maybe 40 miles but that's still way more than most people drive in a day mm -hmm. so obviously this is still a new market this is a new new world, but the data that is available um, is pointing in the right direction. Wow. And maybe at some point you can talk to us about how do we do our best to avoid that degradation of heating up and cooling down. The short answer is uh, don't charge to 100% every day, um, but also know that if you do charge to 100%, the car is lying to you. They've built in a buffer so that you don't charge to 100%. <laughs> Um, and the same thing, if it, if it looks like you've got 5% left, you've got a little bit more than 5% mm -hmm. left. They, the, the batteries don't like extremes. So if you can keep it between 50 and 80% charged, you're great. If you go to 90%, it'll be fine. And then the other thing, when we talk about the types of charging, there's a very high speed charging, which is great for road trips. Um, for many, many years we've said, don't do that every week if you can avoid it, but now there's actually some interesting data coming out that maybe that's not even as bad for the batteries as we yeah. thought. But basically, just keep the car between 50 and 80% most of the time. Does it matter how often you charge? 
Uh, no. It's the, it, the question is um, how full is it and how much heat are you introducing and the higher power charging introduces yeah, yeah. heat. What you don't want to do is wait until you're zero, charge all the way back up, wait until you're zero, oh. charge all the way back up. It's better if, if you can, if you're lucky enough to be able to charge at home, just kind of keep it between 50 and 80. Plug in if you can. If you don't need to, don't worry about it. But it's it's a it's a paradigm shift because with gas cars you're used to like we don't want to go to the gas station, so you're gonna get as close to zero as you can stand it before you go. Mm -hmm. And now instead it's called opportunity charging. If you have the opportunity to charge and you can stay between that 50 80 percent range, then go for it. Um, so one of the things you just mentioned was the uh, nap, <clears throat> and there's I guess it sounded like there's some. Um, change in the theory of not using the best chargers frequently, but is there any information out there about fleets, and in particular, so the town is gradually moving to acquiring electric vehicles and for police cars, and so those need to be charged, and, and they put in a le level three chargers in the town to charge the two electric vehicles that we own at the moment. <laughs> so that would be a concern, I guess, is that, you know, if they're gonna be charging those vehicles literally every day or maybe multiple times in a day because they're they're used you know 24 hours a day essentially so, so the the i'll answer the the sort of two layers of questions i hear so one is what about fleets there's a whole industry gearing up to serve fleet customers yeah. um, in massachusetts we're lucky enough that we have the massachusetts clean energy center which is a quasi-state agency and they have a program called mass fleet advisor which they've, I, th I actually just looked today, they've got 150 spots yet of, I can't remember if they serve public fleets, but definitely private fleets if you are a landscaper or like a, a subcontractor for Amazon or whatever, you have a bunch of vehicles, you can go and they can help you walk through, okay, what are my options? How do I take advantage of all the incentives? How do I install charging? There's help for that. Um, with DC fast charging, the some, we have a webinar coming up in April that's a deep dive into charging, so if you want to get to the nitty gritty of this, we talk about it. But the rate at which the DC fast charging pulls energy depends on how full the battery is already. So if you look at a, a graph basically of um, if we've got time on the x-axis and the kilowatt power draw on the y-axis, if you start at 20% of the battery being full, it's going to ramp up real fast and then when it gets to like 80 percent just slow down because it doesn't want to add, a, add too much heat but if you plug into a dc fast charger and you're already at 80 percent full it's not going to pull at 150 kilowatts because it's like you're 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 already pretty full so i think in that sense if you've got police cruisers who are plugging in every day it might just throttle the charging way down anyway at which point they could have just installed a level two charging station but don't tell them i said that but I, I mentioned that there's new data about the DC fast charging not hurting as much. That is new, so that's something that we're also learning more about. Great, thank so, you. Um, and then last but not least, they're fun to drive. Uh, I have a 95-year-old grandmother who calls the Bolt the nice car because yeah. it's quiet and she can actually hear what everybody's uh. saying. Um, <laughs> they're fast, they're quiet, they're comfortable, they've got great safety features. We've done lots of EV showcases over the years oh. where people are like, no, I need I need this specific feature or this specific ground clearance or there's just, people are diverse and need different things. So our, our answer is usually just go sit in as many cars as you can. Okay, um, I'll move on to just go through a couple, this is sort of the things you should know category. Um, this slide I'll go through real quick. Basically, for a long time, people heard electric vehicle and thought early Nissan Leaf gets 80 miles per charge, and those days are long gone. Uh, at this point, everything gets over 250 miles. Some of the Teslas are getting close to 400. You can, for a lot of the vehicles, pay more to get a version that has a bigger battery to go further. But most people drive 30 or 40 miles a day, and so if you've got 200 miles, that's, that's plenty. We'll talk about how to plan a road trip in a second. Now we're gonna get to some fun nitty gritty stuff, and by fun I mean not fun, but uh, important. <laughs> so there are um, different levels of charging and different plug types. The next slide is gonna show us that the industry is starting to converge, but this slide talks about pre-convergence, what is the situation. So all the Chevy Bolts in the room have this plug. It's called the J1772. 
and you can use it for level one and level two charging. Level one is you plug it into a normal wall outlet. It's a trickle charge is what it's called. And it's four miles of range per hour spent charging. That sounds like nothing, but for some people it's actually plenty. My parents have a Chevy Bolt. They plug in overnight. It charges up 40 miles overnight. They're good. And if they ever need to go on a road trip, they use public charging, but that's fine. Level two is the next level up. It's a 220 volt outlet. That is what you need for an all electric dryer. So something you can install at home. Uh, and these are also out in public um, and I can show you how to find them. But depending on the vehicle that you drive, they add somewhere between 11 or 50 miles uh, per, per hour spent charging. The 11 is some of the older sort of plug-in hybrids. It's much closer to 20 or 30 miles for the newer ones. So this is all for level one and level two. There's a third level, which is called DC fast charging, which is the super high powered thing we were talking about before. You would not install this at your home. These are the types of stations you see at highway rest stops. Walmart is installing a gazillion of them, um, but these are capable of filling like 80% of the battery in half an hour-ish. It depends on the station and the car, but that's a sort of rough measure. Up until now, the industry has been split into, well, I say two, but really three standards. Um, the J1772 combo was used by American and European manufacturers. If you can see, it's just the J1772 with two prongs underneath. So in the bolts, there's a little flap that you unflap to, to use that. And then Asian manufacturers have been using this other plug called the Chatamo plug. Um, and we're starting to shift over to J1772 for the American market. And then Tesla made its entire proprietary charging network soft, well, hardware uh, open and struck a whole bunch of deals. Uh, so now we're moving towards this, which is the North American charging standard, which up until this whole process was basically Tesla's proprietary charging port. Tesla never used these guys. Mm -hmm. You could always get an adapter for J1772. If you're a Tesla driver, you could buy an adapter so you could use these charging stations. The combo there is called the CCS combo? It is called the CCS. Okay, and it's DC fast charging, but that's not level three, is it? I, I was told by the energy nerds that <laughs> level three is actually not an appropriate term to use because it's direct current and we need to distinction make a distinction why it's DC I, fast charging, but it's level three. <laughs> so it's just it's, not, it's that the highest That sounds level. like a very nerd response. It is a very that. nerd response. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so there's supposedly an adapter that we can get to uh, fill in those two bottom ones so we can use Tesla chargers. Yes, so okay. that is what has happened here. Okay. Is that, Sorry. so basically <coughs> the, the backstory of this piece, why not, is that when, um, the, when President Biden signed the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the IAJA, it sets up a National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program, or NEVI, and every state gets a certain amount of money based on some formula to install DC fast charging stations along highways. So Massachusetts is getting $63.5 million to do that over the next five years. And then there's also competitive funds that states can apply for. But in the law, there was a requirement that if you want to use those federal dollars, you have to make the charging station available to more than one make, which was basically Tesla. You can't apply for this federal funding if only Tesla drivers can use it. That prompted Tesla to say, okay, fine, this is what the North American, this is, this is how we build stuff. Uh, and then it made an agreement with basically every major auto manufacturer that starting this year, if you drive a Bolt or a Ford or really any other vehicle, you can get an adapter to use Tesla charging stations. And then starting with model year 2025, those manufacturers are gonna switch to this standard in the vehicles which is great news for consumers because it'll just be simpler. You'll, it, it's gonna be weird for a bit because we've got Tesla charging stations and we've got old non-Tesla charging stations. You might need the adapter, you might not. Also, what does that mean for the entire sort of EV charging industry? That's mm. gonna be really interesting, but from a, I want a car that I can drive to get to see someone in Buffalo or whatever, it'll make things a lot easier. So this is a map of all the Tesla charging stations across the country. Tesla invested early and heavily to make sure that there was infrastructure all across the country. So the people have been driving from coast to coast in Tesla's for a long time. Um, and another sort of benefit of this is that 
Tesla vehicles use this North American charging standard for all levels of charging. It doesn't matter if you're doing level one, level two, or DC fast charging. It n no more nonsense of extra extra prongs or Chatamo for DC fast charging and J1772 for level two. It'll just all be the same plug. It'll be software generated. Right, your car will know that you're pulled up to what kind of a charging station. It's yeah, it's determined by the the power output of that charging station. Right. So the, it'll mm -hmm. it, the the charging station and the vehicle talk to each other um, and say, okay, what's 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 the best uh, power draw right now given the state of the battery, um, including but, if you get the converter. Yes. And that's part of the reason why this is going to take a little while, right. <laughs> because right. they need to get all of these different auto manufacturers car software to now talk to the charging software. Mm -hmm. So on these adapters, it's going to be interesting to see the rollout. Yeah. Um, so Ford has opened up a, a, a form where you can sign up to get one. Rivian is like, we're just going to ship them out to everybody, but in the order that you got a vehicle from us, some of the manufacturers are going to say, we're just going to ship it to you if you ask for it. Some of them might say you have to pay for it. Yeah. It's going to be a little bit of a wild west. Um, and there are already uh, non-car uh, manufacturer approved adapters that are now for sale on the internet. Don't buy those. Mm -hmm. yeah. wait, wait for one that is from the manufacturer of the car. If you're trying to figure out where do I charge? Um, there are lots of different uh, charging network operators who are building out charging stations. You've probably seen ChargePoint because they're nice and orange and bright, um, but there's a lot of different companies that are building out charging stations and then there's some municipalities who might have a charging station for free, like at the library or something. This is a website that allows you to see all that in one place. So you can pull up any address in the state and see what are the charging stations that are nearby. And this is one of those maps where if you zoom out, it, it's just, it's chaos. And like, if you zoom in, more things will pop up. So it's helpful if you're looking at a specific location, but everything that's in orange on this map is a, a DC fast charger. So one of the really high powered ones. And anything that's green is a level two. And you can click on these things and learn more about them. So, okay, this one, if you're a nerd and you wanna know exactly how many kilowatts it outputs at it's 6.48 um, but it'll tell you okay where is it exactly am I paying for the electricity or am I paying for the parking mm -hmm. or am I paying for both what's nearby is it open 24 7 what are the plug types and then sometimes people will um, leave a little check-in people haven't done that for a while here um, but sometimes people are like hi I was here it was great um, and then what's really helpful is that there are photos because sometimes you show up at a like a stop and shop parking lot and it's like there's a charging station here somewhere but like where is it this this can kind of help you figure out okay where is it so this is an example of a charge point charging station so you can use this to um, plan a trip there's a trip planning feature if you're like I want to go this far I want to go here and this is how many miles I'd be willing to drive out of the way there's another tool that you can use to do that too but if you're at the beginning of the sort of poking around to see if this is useful uh, journey, this is a good place to start. This is also available as an app. I had a question about something you said just because I'm really ignorant about the economics. Sure. Uh, you said it was charge for charging or for parking. And yeah, a spot. How does that work? Like, like in Marlboro, if you go in their, their garage, they have a charging station in the garage, but you also have to pay to park there. Oh. That's what but that's not always the case. It, always is, it is a little bit of the Wild West. Yes. So yeah. like a lot of cities or towns as part of a climate thing have installed the charging stations and been like, use it for free. Huh? Um, and then after a couple of years, they might go, actually, we're gonna start charging you, but most just pass on the costs of the electricity. When you do DC fast charging, that's gonna come at a premium because you're paying in part for the convenience of being able to charge that fast. So it yeah. is a little bit more expensive. But in some places, like at some malls, it might be you're just paying to park and the charging is free, but in other places it might be both. But this website is nice because it'll it'll tell you that right up front. Um, but it's always gonna be cheaper than paying for gas, unless you're exclusively charging DC fast charging at Electrify America stations. Don't tell them I said that either. <laughs> That's its own network, Electrify, Electrify America. America. That one was set up as a result of the Volkswagen Dieselgate scandal they were basically directed to spend a lot of money to set up a, a charging 
network. So it's oh. a very weird company. Because they're exclusively DC fast charging stations, oh. um, they're at a, a higher cost. Okay. You can totally install a charging station at home. If you own your own home, you basically buy a unit, which you can do at a home improvement store or online. We have a guide that helps you walk through, like, how do I pick which one? What what do I need to look out for? What do I need to ask my electrician? And then you just need a 240 volt outlet and you need an electrician to connect those two things. Hudson uh, Municipal Light Plant might even have incentives for this. I should have checked, but they I They do, I was just gonna pull them up and find they out. They do. There's a federal tax credit for installation, but you have to live in an area yes. that is designated rural. And Hudson is. And Hudson is, okay, yes. great. But basically, there's resources here. If you rent or live in a condo, it is more complicated, but we've got resources too. Okay, high level. Yeah. There's a federal tax credit for electric cars. There, there has been one since the Obama years. It changed a lot with the Inflation Reduction Act, so there's new rules both for you if you want to claim it and the vehicle if you want to claim it. Um, so it's still up to $7,500, um, but the vehicles have to be eligible by meeting complicated battery and assembly requirements that I'll go over real quick, but basically they're complicated. The good news is it's valid through 2032, uh, which means you can plan this out. Uh, you know, for a while it was just renewed every year and it was kind of complicated, but now it's like it's there until 2032. It's valid for battery electric vehicles, plug-in hybrids, and also fuel cell electric vehicles, mm -hmm. which we are not big proponents of, and I am happy to talk about that if, if needed. The good news is that it can be claimed at the point of sale now. For a long time you had to shell out the $7,500 wait until tax season, file this form, and then wait to get reimbursed, which effectively cut a lot of people out because not everybody can afford to do that. And now you can get it at the point of sale, it's cash on the hood, um, which makes this easier for a lot of folks. You do have to purchase from an IRS registered dealership because they need to check in a fancy portal whether the particular car you're looking at qualifies. And no, the IRS has not published a list of the dealers that are qualified. So you have to ask whatever dealer you're talking to, and quite honestly, ask the, a sales manager or a general manager, even dealers that we've been working with for a long time. This this bit about you having to purchase from an IRS registered dealership took everybody by surprise. And so even dealers that have been leaders in the EV space really? have been like, oh, wait, I sold this car to someone, and they'll just the they'll Internal Revenue Service is that? What yeah. yeah, sorry, I should have said that because it's all federal tax credit. So, oh, oh. Um, and so basically the IRS set up a, a clean energy credits online portal that the dealer has to say, I sold this vehicle to this person, they're getting the federal tax credit and has to hand you a piece of paper to prove that they did that. But the, the, either the manufacturers haven't told the dealers or the dealers haven't told their own staff, there's a lot of confusion right now. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it'll get clear. Um, but then the third thing to know is that there are income requirements, so your income has to be under those limits for you to qualify for this credit. If you're curious, the complicated requirements that I talked about, one is that the vehicle has to be assembled in North America. The price cap, the price has to be under this cap, so this is not, ne not necessarily the price that you pay, but the manufacturer's suggested retail price. So if you're getting a vehicle that the MSRP is under $55,000, but then you got the heated seats package and that pushed it over 55, you still qualify as long as the MSRP is under 55. And then for SUVs and everything else, it's 80. And then there are really complicated mineral and battery requirements. Basically, there's one set of requirements for the minerals and one set of requirements for the components. If the vehicle meets both, and meets the other two requirements, then it's $7,500. If it only meets one, it's 3750 If it doesn't meet any, then it's zero. Um, the point of all of this is to try and address all of the very legitimate issues that people have with the supply chain for batteries and try and build up manufacturing and recycling within North America. It is very complicated in practice and very confusing for consumers, but that, that's why that's there. There is also, for the first time, a tax credit for used EVs. Um, so the good news is all those complicated battery requirements I just mentioned do not apply uh, for used vehicles. The amount is $4,000 or 30% of the sales price, whichever is lower. Uh, you, again, have to buy from an IRS registered dealership, which is even harder for used vehicle dealers than new vehicle dealers, because the used vehicle dealers have never had to think about this before at all. 
The vehicle has to be at least two years old and cost less than $25,000. And it has to be the first owner selling it. Although you have to buy it from a dealership, but basically if you're the third owner, you don't qualify, even if the second owner didn't take the federal tax credit. Hmm. And th this is another reason why you have to go through an IRS registered dealer because they can tell on their portal whether you qualify or not. And then the income threshold is basically half of what it is for you. So with all of that, how to claim the federal tax credit. Um, you can choose to transfer the credit at the dealership, so the dealership takes the credit and they lower the price that you pay, or if you really enjoy filling out form 8936, you can say that I'll file this form when I do my taxes, but either way, you need to make sure you're at an IRS registered dealership and get them to give you some paperwork, which we'll go over in a second. Good news, for a long time, before you could take it at the point of sale, if your tax liability was not great enough to capture the full value of the federal tax credit, then you basically lost out on that incentive, which meant that it was much easier for wealthier people to take advantage of the incentive than less wealthy people. Now, because you can transfer the tax uh, credit to the dealership, that means your tax liability is no longer relevant, which is really good news in terms of opening this up to a lot more people. Um, but if you do do it, when you file your taxes, then your tax liability is still uh, important. Make sure that the dealership is registered with the IRS. Make sure they give you a copy of the time of sale report, so they need to file something in that system. You want them to give you a copy of that and a copy of a confirmation that they get from the IRS that that has gone through successfully. And then even if you take it at the point of sale, you have to file this form at tax time. Um, so this is, takeaway here is, Pay attention to this later if you're in the market. <coughs> um, one important loophole, it's not quite a loophole, but it's effectively a loophole, is that the Inflation Reduction Act also created a tax credit for commercial vehicles that has none of these complicated requirements, which means if you are leasing a vehicle, the leasing agent can file for the federal tax credit because it's a vehicle that they're using for business purposes, and so a lot of them pass the value of that down to the consumer in better lease payments. So, the VW has been advertising the ID4 as $7,500 off your lease. That's not I, VW being generous, that is them passing the federal tax credit onto you. Although I guess they could have chosen to keep it, but they're, they're trying to compete. So a lot of the, the Hyundai and Kia vehicles right now, for example, are really, really popular, but all of them are um, assembled in South Korea, so they don't qualify. But a lot of people are <coughs> because that's a way to, to capture that federal tax credit. I will now talk about state incentives real quick. Basically, the state has a program called MORE EV. It stands for Massachusetts Offers Rebates for Electric Vehicles. And it now has several like subcategories, depending on what type of vehicle you're looking for and sort of um, who you are. So the standard program is $3,500. It's only for battery electric vehicles, so plug-in hybrids do not qualify. The total MSRP must be under $55,000. It qualifies for a purchase or a lease if the lease is at, 36, at least 36 months. And you don't have to purchase from a Massachusetts dealership. Um, you can basically go online after you purchase, fill out a form, and they'll send you a check in the mail. Or if you buy it from a dealership that is participating in the state point of sale rebate program, you can get it at the point of sale. And the state does actually have a list of dealers. So you can see, okay, if I wanna buy from this dealership, they can give this to me at the point of sale. And the 3500 is for used also. It is indeed. I was very surprised. Yeah, so here the final sales price has to be less than $40,000, which is higher than the limit for the federal tax credit. You do have to buy it at a Massachusetts dealership. It's retroactive, which at this point is kind of a moot point. And you're supposed to confirm that that particular vehicle has not gotten a more EV rebate for the past three years, which very hard for you to figure out so you basically sign an attestation form that to the best of your knowledge it hasn't been um, and then this is limited though to people who qual who participate in uh, one of a list of income qualifying programs or whose modified adjusted gross income is under those limits and then again you can purchase for this at, get this at the point of sale or post purchase but if you go uh, point of sale you have to have a um, what is the word pre-qualification pre through um, the website. In addition to this, there is more EV Plus, which is an additional rebate for folks who qualify as low income. 
Uh, here, you have to prove that you are low income by participating in one of those, the list of programs. Um, so it's a little bit confusing because here, you're, you can also use your income to prove that you're eligible, but for more EV Plus, your income is actually irrelevant. It's just the list of programs um, that you want to participate in, but it adds $1,500 to the rebate. Uh, there's also a rebate for trucks, which is called more EV trucks, which really is just a limited number. This is mostly for commercial entities, so mm -hmm. for individuals, it's basically if you want a pickup truck or one of the really big SUVs, then that qualifies as more EV truck because they're so heavy. Um, and this one is open to um, individuals, fleets, nonprofits, and even uh, local government, which the regular more EV is not. Mm -hmm. So that's a good thing to keep in mind for your climate action plan. And so um, these are some of the vehicles that qualify. Um, the Ford E Transit, the Ford Transit is one of the most used sort of cargo vans and, and people vans in the state. And it's also one of the most easily acquired electric sort of medium sized vehicles. So if you have a senior services van or a library van or a boys and girls club van, like that is a great choice. And then there's some uh, pickup trucks and just really, really, really big electric vehicles um, that qualify for this. This is an additional rebate. If you are replacing a very, very old gas-powered car with an electric vehicle, you get an additional $1,000. And so there's lots of requirements on how to make sure that that vehicle is eligible. Basically, it has to be at least 12 years old. You have to prove that you didn't just buy it off of Craigslist to get this $1,000, <laughs> but like it's actually been used in your family and registered and all that. Um, but this is as a result of a, a line in the climate law that passed in Massachusetts in 2022 that said that there should be an adder for trade-in, so here we go. So, summary of this, you've got more EV standard, more EV trucks, and more EV used. The first column shows you the rebate. The second column shows you if more EV, um, what more EV plus would add third column adds uh, more EV trade-in, so you can see the total. But all of this is explained on the more EV website in great detail. And then we've made it to the end here. This is this tool that we have built that shows you for all of the vehicles that are generally available, um, a lot of key information. So it'll show you, is it battery electric or is it a plug-in hybrid? Is it an SUV or a sedan or a pickup? What is the range? Is it all-wheel drive or not? Um, what is the efficiency? What's the battery size? Can it tow things? How fast does it charge? And then over here you can see the price, federal tax credit, state rebate. Um, and you'll see for some of these that there's a current best deal. We uh, have a network of car dealers who post prices on our website on a monthly basis. This network used to be a lot stronger and then the pandemic happened and we've been trying to rebuild it. So. That's why you've got these 10 vehicles up here that are from dealers that we partner with, but we show lots of vehicles that are not. Um, so you can learn about them and, and try and sort of narrow down your choices. Um, that is it. Thank you for sitting through all of that. All right. I'm contractually obliged uh, to show this slide. We're a nonprofit. <laughs> we have a match right now for the rest of the uh, month of March, um, but also just a general thank you. We've got. Um, a newsletter and a Facebook group and lots of stuff if you want to learn. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Too. Yeah. We have so many webinars. Yeah, there's lots. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Yes.